Hello everyone and welcome back to another anatomy tutorial where we are going to be talking about the anatomy of the head and neck of the chicken. In this uh, tutorial we will look at the external features of the head of the chicken and uh, after that we will talk about the anatomy of the internal structures inside the or pharynx cavity and we will look also at the anatomy of the structures which we can see in the neck area. Here we have a head of male chicken. In the head area, species specific accessory cutaneous structures could be seen, like this structure here, the comb or what's called the crista carnosa, located on the top of the head. So the comb here is still very small and the male is only four months old. Ventral to the lower jaw, here we can see what's called the wattle. The wattle is a fold of skin. It's bigger normally in old males, so we have the right and the left wattle. Here caudally we can find the auricular lobe, or what's called the ear lobe. It's a blind sac. This blind sac is located just under the ear opening. So this is here the ear opening and this sac is located just under it. If we look exactly here we can see the external opening to the ear covered as you can see with some feathers. So here this area here if we move the feathers to the side, you can see the opening to the ear. With regards to the beak, here we can see the rostrum maxillar or the upper beak. Caudal to the upper beak, we can find the nars. Here, a cornified blade known as operculum projects from the dorsal border of the nars, as you can see here. Here we can see the rostrum mandibular or the lower beak and here we can notice the absence of teeth or lips in the beard. And here we open the mouth completely so we can look at the internal structures inside the oropharynx cavity. So we have a very good view where we can describe all structures inside the oropharynx cavity. Why did I say oropharynx cavity? Because birds lack a soft palate. So there is no clear separation between the oral cavity and the pharynx or between the roof of the mouth and the pharynx here in this area. So there is no soft palate here. And that's why we will name all the area here as oropharynx cavity. The ballot or palatum forms the dorsal boundary of the combined cavities or the oropharynx as we described before. Here in the middle of the ballot we can see the median palatine ridge. While laterally here we have the lateral palatine ridge. The ballot is covered by non-glandular curtainized mucosa. This mucosa has several caudally directed papillae, like this one there, or this one here. Those papillae are caudally oriented and they are like mechanical papillae. They have mechanical function in transporting the food toward the pharynx. And we name them Balatine papillae. This one here also, the Balatine papilla. The pharyngeal papilla, uh, our papilla found inside the pharynx, are similar to that one of the ballet. They are also caudally oriented and uh, helping in transporting the food toward the pharynx. Here in the middle we can see this opening, the kuana. In the middle of the ballet, it's an elongated, sometimes oval, median cleft, the kuana, this area here, connects the left and right nasal cavity with the oropharynx. The 
the guana uh, will be closed automatically uh, if there is any food inside the oropharynx cavity to avoid any uh, food to go into the nasal cavity. Caudal to the guana, there is a short infundibular cleft or called the mima infundibuli. Anatomically, it's located inside the pharynx, which is connects with the middle ear. In birds, the left and the right tuba auditiva join and open into the recess inside the infundibular cleft. So this is the infundibular cleft, which represents, you know, the connection between the middle ear and the oropharynx cavity. This cleft is open all the time. That's why the bird doesn't have any problem with the pressure inside the middle ear, you know, while flying up and down. Here, I would like to remind you that the upper beak and the lower beak, they don't have teeth. So there's no teeth in bird. In the floor of the oropharynx cavity, we can find the tongue. The tongue conforms the shape of the lower beak. The tongue is divided into the apex. Here we have the body of the tongue or the corpus lingua. And finally, here we have the root of the tongue or the radix lingua. In chickens, between the body of the tongue and the radix or the root of the tongue, here we can find the transverse row of caudal directed lingual babilla, so they are also caudally oriented and they have the same function like the others we learned before to transport the food toward the pharynx. Here inside the tongue we can find a bone called the baraglossus and here we can see how the tongue is fixed somehow to the hypobronchial apparatus of the chicken this one here so these two bones this one here and that one there are parts of the hypobronchial apparatus of the chicken over there deeper inside the oropharynx cavity behind or caudal to the tongue we can find this structure here this is the larynx. The larynx of the bird is very simple. As you can see, there is no epiglottis comparing to other domestic animals. There are two arytenoid cartilage, uh, one uh, cricoid cartilage, and small dorsal located brochlicoid cartilage. In the middle of the larynx, here we can see this opening, the glottis. So, as we said, the glottis, which we can see in the middle of the larynx here, is the entrance to the laryngeal cavity. And as we said also that there is no epiglottis to avoid the food to go to the respiratory system. In this case, the arytenoid cartilage, left and right, are responsible to close the glottis during the food transportation to the pharynx. Dorsally, at the dorsal surface of the larynx is covered with well-defined pharyngeal babilla. The pharyngeal babilla here are also caudally oriented and they have also mechanical function to push the food to the next part of the digestive system, in this case to the cervicus. Deeper there, inside the pharynx, we can see on the lateral side, left and right, we can see the pharyngeal tonsil. They are lymphatic tissue, of course. In the neck area, and after we removed the feathers from this area, here we can see the jugular vein. In this case, we are talking about the right jugular vein which is a good place to take blood or inject medication as you can see here. 
Normally we don't use the jugular vein a lot in birds, but if um, there is no other option, so it's a very good place where we can uh, take blood or inject medication as you can see. And now let's open the neck and look at the structures which we can see in the neck area. So in this case, if we remove the skin here to the side, we can see very clearly there the external jugular vein. This is the jugular vein. And ventrally and more on the right side here we can see the cervicus the cervicus is a flexible thin wall tube that extends from the pharynx to the proventriculus there we can see the trachea the cervical part of the cervicus initially leads dorsal to the trachea in this area in the mid to lower cervical region both the cervicus and the trachea pass to the right side of the neck, as you can see here. Again, here we can see the right jugular vein. As I said before, as an option to take blood or inject medication. Let's look one more time of the structures inside the neck area after removing the skin completely. Here we can see the right jugular vein. On the right side here we have the cervicus. As we said here in this area is located dorsal to the trachea while in the middle and the lower is more to the right side. This is the trachea. So the cervicus moves caudally and forms what's called the crop. The crop is formed by the dilation of the cervicus immediately before its entry into the body cavity there, here. So as you can see here, at the thoracic inlet, in this area, the cervicus widens to form the crop the crop is very important as a place for temporary storage of the ingesta and at the same time it's very important for softening the food before moving to the proventriculus. So what is this again? This is the crop. In the neck area, next to the jugular vein, we can see the thymus. The thymus is divided into small lobes. These lobes lie adjacent to the jugular vein from the caudal to the third cervical vertebra to the cervical thoracic boundary, as you can see here on the left and of course on the right side. So this is the thymus. The trachea is relatively long in bird comparing to other domestic animals, extends from the caudal border of the cricoid cartilage caudally and uh, if you look at the trachea rings, uh, they are completely closed. They are completely closed and overlapping each other. So in contrast to other domestic animals, there is no opening in the dorsal area of the trachea.